Well, good morning, and thank you. And, uh, and again, thanks to the Milken Institute for allowing us to be here today and, uh, and to cover a subject that uh, I think is more exciting than whatever Mike is talking about in the, in the real big room with Ken. So um, first, to go through and introduce uh, my panel here, starting over here in the right, Glenn August with uh, Oak Hill, who's CEO of that. Uh, Victor Kozla here, who's uh, at SVP Global as CIO. Uh, Greg Lipman to my left at Libramax, he's a CIO. Virginie Morgon to his left, who's CEO of Eurasio. And then Raymond Spider at the end, chairman and partner at BC uh, Partners. So um, last year, there was a panel that I and Virginie were on, and we were covering whether there was too much dry powder in the private equity business. And we realized on that panel that the biggest subject to talk about was this migration of, of money from the public markets into the private markets. It's, it was our own immigration crisis um, on the one hand, but one where you were welcoming all of this money moving into private capital. And so uh, I want to cover some slides. Uh, as an Italian, I could use my hands to make uh, hyperbole and big points, but slides here I think are going to help us show how dramatic this is. So if I can, to the slide man, could you give us slide number one, please? All right, slide number one. So what you see here is a number of public U.S. companies. Now, if you were a botanist, you would identify this as an endangered plant. Um, the pollen count has gotten down by 45% over the last 20 years. Slide two, please. Now, here you have the exact same line, which is here in gold, but the blue line is the number of companies that are owned by PE firms. Now, I'm kind of like PE firms, but if you were a public-oriented guy, you would see this as an invasive species. Slide three. <laughs> now, while this has been going on, the IPO business is down 70% from what would have been the average in the 90s to what's the average today, 70% in number of transactions. What's interesting, though, are the transactions that are being done are much bigger than they were before. They're in the hundreds of billions of dollars at times. Whereas in the past, a billion dollars was a big deal. And they're also uh, staying private longer. Um, and, and that we'll come back to in a little bit. Slide five, please. Now, here we see what's happening in private equity assets under management. And an interesting statistic is that there's been $5.7 trillion that's moved into this private capital uh, since 2009. Uh, slide six, same kind of slope occurring in private credit, private debt. Uh, last year alone, it was $110 billion raised. Slide seven, and if you're a commercial bank, you're seeing in the blue your contribution to the capital markets related to, let's say, financial sponsor work in the mid-market being increasingly small, being crowded out, by a disintermediation being caused by private capital and institutional money effectively being in the loan business. And finally, slide four. So um, here, just to not kill public markets completely, while the percentage or the number of public companies have been reduced, <coughs> um, the value of those public companies continues to increase and increases at a particularly good rate. Now first, is this is a phenomenon in the U.S., and, and hopefully a little, a little later, version A might tell us whether she's seeing this, uh, and maybe Raymond, too, whether they're seeing any of this overseas. But um, it seems to be, the hypothesis is, that the public market is focusing on the big, the simple, the liquid, and, and where many of the panelists make their living in the complex, the interesting, the distressed, uh, the levered, those transactions are going to the people up here today. So what I'd like to do to start is maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Um, we'll run down the lineup and give us just a background on, on what the firm you're with is doing and, uh, and kind of how you fit into the whole private, uh, private capital scheme. 
Glenn? Uh, very quickly, thanks for all being here. Uh, Glenn August, CEO and founder of Oak Hill Advisors. I've been doing this for 32 years. Uh, today we manage about $34 billion across the whole below investment grade credit spectrum. Bank loans, high yield stress, distress, private credit, structured credit, uh, US and Europe. Uh, we do it for large sovereign wealth funds and separate account form and large pension funds. We do it in commingled funds. Uh, we do it through a CLO platform as well. And uh, I've watched and been a part of the evolution of the leverage finance market. And so both as a student, observer, participant, uh, I find this stuff fascinating still after 32 years, and it's nice to be here. So thank you. Uh, Victor Kostler, I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Strategic Value Partners. Uh, we, we focus on distressed debt, on event-driven debt, and we also take control of companies and run them. We have a, your classic distressed for control sort of product. About $8 billion in assets under management, 120 people, and, and then when you kind of think of us, our business is split almost equally between the United States and Europe. If, if, I, was to, if I was to kind of uh, drive distinctions, we find that our business is getting so much more competitive. The charts which Jim had, larger and larger asset sizes, much more competitive business, and to distinguish ourselves, to have an edge, what we really started to do 10 years ago, we, we started to do quite a few different things, right? So we started to source deals directly from commercial banks, and today we compete with Wall Street. We've got larger sourcing trading teams than Goldman Sachs does, for instance. And the second thing we did was we said, boy, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit operationally. When a company goes into bankruptcy, it, uh, it, you know, management is just beaten at that point in time after the last few years. There is low-hanging fruit. And 10 years ago, we started to build operating teams in-house. So as you look at us today as a firm, you see not just, hopefully, smart investment people, but what you see is direct sourcing and origination and operating control of businesses. There are 10 businesses today with 15,000 or so employees which we own, which we control through the distressed debt restructuring process. Okay, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, uh, Greg Lipman, I founded uh, <coughs> Libramax Capital in 2010. When we started, we were uh, just a hedge fund with about 400 million uh, <coughs> under management and 15 employees. And today, um, nine years later, we have 7 billion across a variety of strategies from, from, from traditional hedge funds to private equity. And we own a CLO manager and we're 50 people. Um, our involvement in, in, in direct lending and, and, and private credit is more on the side of taking advantage of bank regulation and, and making loans to finance companies to warehouse assets before securitizations that were typically done by the banks that, that they're prevented from doing now. And in a lot of cases, we're able to, to structure transactions where we have a, a better attachment point, more stringent uh, triggers and, and uh, protections of our, on our assets at wider spreads than are available in the public market. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Virginie Morgan. I'm the CEO of uh, Eurasio. I've been, um, I joined the company about 12 years ago. I wish I could say I founded it. I'm a big investor in uh, this company, which is a listed private equity company. We were born French um, 100 years ago. Uh, we certainly have some European successes. <coughs> And we have ambition in the US, which um, I decided to build and open, to open an office in the US about three years ago. We are essentially private equity. I've got about 250 people, either in Europe or in the US. We have uh, invested in more than 300 companies in Europe and in the US. And it's basically from venture to gross capital, mid cap, large cap. Um, that's essentially what we do, bringing significant value. So. I'm certainly you know, quite uh, aware of that shift from public to private market, um, and also you know, very well aware of the benefit of being a public company myself, um, which is what has been your ASIO for many years. Raymond. Uh, Raymond Spider. <coughs> I'm the uh, chairman and uh, partner at BC Partners. Uh, BC Partners has been in business for 33 years. 
um, and we have three lines of business. At the moment, we manage about $27 billion of AUM. Uh, the main line of business which we've been operating in uh, for the past uh, you know, 33 years is private equity. That's our mature business, which we continue to grow. Um, you know, there, we're investing currently our 10th private equity fund. Um, and in that strategy, which we operate in both uh, Europe, uh, which is our legacy, and North America, um, uh, you know, we buy basically uh, controlled stakes uh, in mid to large size companies, uh, you know, with a view, of course, to uh, you know, creating value, developing those businesses. Um, uh, so that's in PE. We have a credit business that we started uh, two years ago now, where we currently manage $2 billion of assets. <clears throat> uh, where we've built the team, we've been the origination team, we've built the foundation, and now we're scaling it. Uh, that business has two uh, components. One is a yield business, one is an opportunistic business, and a bunch of uh, insurance solutions products. Um, and uh, we have started about a year ago um, a, a real estate business, which is European-based, uh, you know, which we are uh, currently developing. Um, there's no question that <clears throat> you know, all of the slides that have been um, uh, presented so far, uh, you know, illustrates what we always know, uh, which is that, you know, over many, many years now, uh, uh, private capital has delivered, um, um, and there's, you know, enough historical evidence at this point in time, in time has delivered uh, more uh, consistent and higher returns than the public markets. Um, you know, and I think, you know, what we're seeing across asset classes, uh, which you've seen on the slides, is just the illustration of this, uh, which, um, you know, I don't necessarily believe is uh, something that's going to stop anytime soon. So based on, on that set of, of introductions and disclosures of, of, of what the panelists work on, you can see that what we have up here is, is, is the range that boxes the subject very well. We have U.S. and Europe, or global. We have illiquid and liquid strategies. We have debt and equity investors. We have distressed investors and, and good market, happy day investors. And then we also have public and private companies, one public company. So we're going to be able to kind of lasso this and tighten, tighten it up a bit. So I'm going to start with Glenn and a bit of a, um, a generalist question. We've seen what's happening to the markets. Is it because what you do on the private side is, is so attractive? Or is it what the public markets uh, do is no longer competitive that, that leads to this flow and, and flow in your direction? Um, so I think investors are looking to construct portfolios to hit a certain return target. And that return target uh, for most pension funds, uh, institutions, is in the range of 6 to 8%. And of course, everyone would like higher. But uh, with interest rates, 10-year rates at 25 it's hard to do that. And so the reason why alternatives as an asset class broadly defined, including the strategies that we all talk about, uh, is simply put because in the core fixed income market with rates where they are, you can't generate those returns. Uh, equities have had obviously an extraordinary run. People got excited in December that maybe there was gonna be a greater value opportunity that would be more prolonged and that snapped back quickly. And so if you're an institutional investor and you're trying to deliver a six to eight percent return for your investors, and you think the public equity markets are whether they're six to eight on average, five to seven, you pick, and two and a half in core fixed income and investment grade spreads have tightened back to 150, then you need alternative investments. And so credit and private equity make sense in portfolios. And uh, the question then becomes to me when we talk to investors is where do you want to allocate? exposure in your alternatives between private equity and private credit. And what I would say, without being overly biased, because I'm, I'm a big believer that private equity makes sense in a portfolio, I think private credit has gained a lot of interest over the last couple of years in particular, and will continue to grow in interest because on a relative value basis, the opportunity to make 8 to 12% on levered type returns and have more downside protection in credit versus a private equity portfolio, which I'm sure our, our colleagues up here uh, will say they can make 15 to 20%, but the reality is when you look at 10 years of data in the, one of the greatest bull markets of all time, the returns are in the 11, 12 range. And so private credit makes a lot of sense. 
we can talk a lot more, and I'll certainly be happy to comment later, about portions of private credit, whether it's the middle market slide that was shown earlier, whether it's actually providing, we're very excited about providing direct financing to larger cap transactions on a private basis, whether it's distressed on both an opportunistic basis in Europe or elsewhere, or whether it's being ready for more dislocation. So all those niche strategies, whether it's hard asset strategies, I mean, whether it's CLO structured credit strategies, each of those strategies offer investors a different risk adjusted return profile in a firm like ours is trying to have a, an array of strategies to meet the risk return profiles of our investors. So that's how we think about it. I'm gonna jump over to Ray, or Raymond. And Raymond, when you look at the, what Glenn has just covered about private debt, your firm has historically been a very big player in global private equity, but you've been expanding into private debt. Can you go through the logic of that? And then I'll have a follow-up for you. Of course. <clears throat> the first thing I say, though, is that you know, for those of you who are in the room, uh, Glenn uh, is just uh, providing numbers, which uh, I'm not sure are totally accurate. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's good start here. <laughs> it sounds better when he says were, it in French. Go ahead. You were, you were expecting me to say that. Uh, uh, but the reality certainly is that if you invest in a fourth quarter quartile manager, that's probably what you'll get. Uh, but the first and second quartile manager continues to continue to deliver uh, above 20%. Um, you know, as far as your question is concerned, uh, Indeed, we decided uh, a few years ago to, to get into private debt. Uh, first of all, you know, what people need to understand is that if there's one asset class which is the most adjacent and synergistic with private equities, it is private debt. Um, and that's the reason why we decided to go into it. Obviously, you're investing in the same companies simply you know, somewhere else in the capital structure. And when you manage both on an integrated basis, which is what we do as opposed to separating the, the, uh, the, the units, um, you know, it gives you, it, you know, frankly, it makes us better PE investors uh, because we understand better how to manage the liability piece uh, of the capital structure. We understand better, we have a better appreciation of how the market prices those securities, uh, you know, with more knowledge, frankly. And from the private debt standpoint, um, you know, actually our industry expertise, because we're organized by sector, um, you know, our network of contacts, um, and actually, in, even in certain cases, which has surprised me, our sourcing ability in PE, you know, we've, we've been in situations whereby we're looking at a PE invest, investment which actually generates a proprietary, um, you know, private credit and stru structured credit uh, opportunity. So, you know, that's the reason why we decided to do this. Uh, I mean, the other reason, of course, is that increasingly, <coughs> although it's probably only the beginning of this point in time, some, not all, but you know, very few, but you know, it, may, it may evolve over time. Some of the very, very large uh, institutional investors are uh, increasingly interested in, instead of investing, okay, I'm gonna invest in that strategy and that strategy, why don't I uh, generate some more of a strategic relationship with you know, the GPs that I'm, uh, I'm close to and that I value, who are good across several strategies? Uh, and clearly, if you're only monoproduct, uh, you can't necessarily uh, respond to that demand. Um, so that's one of the other reasons why we've done it. But the primary reason is the one that I've uh, already explained. Jim, could I jump yeah, in yeah, with a comment, absolutely. Yep. please? Yeah. Uh, look, I, I do agree with what uh, uh, Glenn said, what Raymond said in a way. Yeah, great growth. As you look forward from here, feel, feel pretty good about it. And going and raising money for new asset classes, great. But one big caution, we are late in a cycle. The lending today, when the public markets are willing to lend you the way they are, <clears throat> in private, private debt, a lot of the lending going on where you can make coupons is for 10 million, 20 million, 30 million EBITDA businesses. And when you are starting businesses from scratch today, at this point, you, you're not, you don't have any distinct sourcing. And by the way, I would just really worry that uh, a, a lot of the talent we see on offer, right, as at this late in a cycle which big firms are able to hire, they're not really hiring the sort of talent Glenn has, for instance, in kind of his business, right? So I, my, my only concern is not so much, boy, yeah, great, there's growth, but just, just watch out this late in a cycle without a distinctive competitive edge, just kind of what happens. Uh, Victor, back in, I remember 2014, 
I tried to convince FEMA that the world was going to end and we should be doing distress to distress. Were you saying the same thing back then? And what have you been doing for the last five years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what we what we found is uh, distressed is uh, distressed is not a evergreen strategy. It, you clearly need a crash or so on to give it some juice, right? But what we find for ourselves was, over the last five years, we've been able to build a business which is US Europe. We've been able to source directly. And I think what we have done over the last five and the last 15 years is we tend to invest pretty steadily, maybe 20% of a fund in a year like 2018 or 19. And then you get a crash and we go to 30% a year. 35% a year. And I think for us, all that has worked. There was a slide up there. Could you put slide eight on, please? If you look at that slide, you know, in a market where uh, in the US there hasn't been very much distress debt, if you look at European bank disposals on the right side, European banks have been cleaning up their balance sheets 100 billion. 125 billion euros a year. In the US, there's only 100 billion of non-performing loans on bank balance sheets today, right? So when you look at the, there are ways to make money in these years, but you've got to look differently, you've got to look elsewhere, and, and you've got to be ready to lean in when the crash kind of comes. So I'm gonna go back to Raymond for the follow-up question that I, was, that I had earlier. Um, so interest rates are a big part, you know, very low, infinite capital available. Obviously, that's driving great returns on the private equity side for you, right? Do you, do you have a strategy or a concern when those rates or access to capital maybe move the other direction? That's for me? Yeah. Um, well, first I'm going to start maybe by correcting some of the uh, stuff that you've said. Uh, I don't believe necessarily at all, actually, that uh, the availability of capital, debt capital, is creating you know, much better returns for the, uh, uh, for the PE funds. Um, you know, the reality is that we are all public market investors, distressed in, uh, uh, debt investors, PE investors, <coughs> um, operating uh, uh, under a, an environment where valuation levels are high, where we are late cycle. So, you know, the question is not, well, that's the environment, what do I do, and, you know, do I wait for the next <coughs> uh, distress cycle, uh, or do, do I sort of stay on the sideline for the next, you know, six months, one year, two years, three years, um, um, uh, for the environment to correct? Uh, you know, the real question is, where do you find uh, the right opportunities and the right risk rewards in the current environment? And the good news is that, you know, at least as far as what we do on the, on the PE side, um, you know, you need to be incredibly disciplined, you need to hustle, you need to have a clear strategy, but if you do, uh, and it's hard, you can continue to find, um, you know, appropriate risk rewards, um, you know, where, when, you, when you take on projects which, uh, you know, perhaps require a bit more work than, you know, simply uh, buying in 2010 um, and then selling in 2014. I'm not sure I totally addressed your question, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm going to now ask Virginie a question about her structure. Um, because I, I think that as I go through your investments, not a lot of them seem to be interest rate driven. Um, and you also have a public private hybrid of how your, your money is raised. Is, is, is that related? It, what are the advantages of having a public stock? private capital, and is one of those advantages um, the freedom to be long-term thinking and, and have patient uh, capital, but is a disadvantage that you might be required to stay away from certain kinds of investments like distressed or, or leveraged deals? Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, okay, I mean, to your earlier question, and Raymond could have addressed it, I mean, what you showed in terms of US slides, US trends, you see the exact same thing in Europe. Um, even more so, I mean, less public company, I think the drop over the last 10 years has been 
30% less public company in Europe, and um, you know, e explosive private equity, uh, private equity market. So certainly same trends, um, even, even stronger. As far as uh, Eurasil is concerned, you know, the fact that we have um, a public company, meaning permanent capital, so the size of the company, we are managing about $20 billion. Two-thirds of this is private equity, so investment in companies in private equity type. Um, but of this, about $7 billion is permanent capital, so on the balance sheet of Eurasil. So I, I think what, what we... And we've been public for many, many years, so we were born public in a way because the company has been public since the end of the 19th century, believe it or not. So there's more public company now in, in, in our environment, more private equity becoming public. Um, but the size of the capital that we have allows us to do a number of things. The first one is to invest very long term if we wish to. And I think that certainly helps vis-a-vis -vis what sort of industry can we, can we get into or support. Um, maybe we can take more risk and hopefully get more rewards because we know we can hold on to those investments for longer if need be. I'm very often asked, you know, how long do you actually you know, keep your investment on, on your balance sheet? And the answer is not so different than the average you know, length period of a private equity fund because it's about five and a half or six years. But the fact that you can hold on to your investment for much longer um, makes an enormous difference. Um, it certainly helps in terms of the dialogue that you have with the entrepreneur and the management team. It certainly helps in your decision making. So that's one. Um, the second benefit of having permanent capital is that we, we've sort of applied to ourselves what we were doing in our portfolio companies. So I've started thinking about seven years ago, but what about buying businesses for Eurasio and expanding the firm with more talent, more talent pool. And we progressively did that by either buying existing companies in private equity, either small cap or venture or growth, um, or launching new, new strategies. So basically either build-ups or organic growth. Same recipe than the one that we have for our portfolio company, and that's how we've grown so fast over the last years. So for public investors, they have a diversification in, in buying into Eurasio stock. They're basically accessing public equi you know, private equity returns, both through a public equity investment. So they get the liquidity, although they also get the discounts on the net asset value, which you know, we're working hard to you know, reduce. But depending on where you are in the cycle, if you're a public company, you're likely to have you know, a wider or, you know, a shorter discount depending on the momentum. So I think that that really allows us to think um, in a very ambitious and aggressive manner in our own development. Um, and certainly, you know, before you have to convince your LPs or institutional backers that this new strategy that you want to launch makes sense and you have track record, if you really believe in what you're doing, then you're financing 100% on your balance sheet. Is there any tax benefit to being public or private there in the, in the US? It's a big driver. Yeah, I mean, there's this you know, big uh, you know, move into you know, becoming um, a, a full brown corporation in the US. Um, you know, we are, uh, we are a corporation. Uh, we're paying taxes like, just like any corporation, depending on the level of profit. Uh, what, what's more interesting is how much you own and how much you buy into the company in which we invest. And that's, that's where the tax structure may play, and you certainly have to have control at least a minimum of 5%. So, no, it, it, it's, it's not similar to what you have in the U.S. I think, you know, the, the big game of being public or private is making sure that you can, being a public company, the challenge for us and for me as CEO of these companies, to make sure that you can serve a regular dividend, because a lot of my shareholders are also here for a dividend, and that you can create on a recurring basis a share price appreciation so that you can serve regularly an you know, increase of both dividend and stock price appreciation of at least 10% a year. 
Well, one of the things I typically in, in private capital, you, you step out, do something new by hiring someone that knows how to do that. You go to your old relationships and you get funded. Acquisitions is something that Eurasio has been doing. And now, Greg, you've recently, or you know, relatively recently, considering your background, been getting into private debt and, and bought six CLOs with Primarant. So you, 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 you've made two decisions. One decision is to get into private debt, and then two, the decision to do it through acquisition. Can you go through your thinking on that? Sure. Um, well, thankfully, they gave me this microphone to help my voice. I don't know that they can help my firm get as big <laughs> as the firms around me. If they can, anybody can help with that, <laughs> would be great. Um, we recently entered into, a, uh, we took an investment from Dial Partners and, and used some of those proceeds to buy a CLO manager. What attracted us about getting involved in CLOs was uh, as a hedge fund and in, our, in some of our private equity vehicles, we've been a long time investor in CLO tranches. And as part of the acquisition, uh, we got eight, um, eight credit professionals and access to a library of over a thousand credits. So we felt um, on the business side, there was a big synergy in terms of getting smarter about becoming a better CLO tranche investor, becoming smarter. Uh, we've been a, a corporate, a direct corporate, mostly public corporate investor for a number of years, get access to uh, the write-ups for the corporate side. I think in addition, uh, on a business perspective, the CLO manager gives us insight quicker to the turn of the cycle from the corporate perspective as we'll be uh, on top from a monitoring perspective, uh, corporate credits. So it's going to make us smarter uh, on timing the turn since we all know it's late cycle, whatever exactly that means. Uh, and we're 18 to 36 months perpetually away from the next recession. Uh, but hopefully the CLO manager will give us a certain amount of insight there. And when the cycle turns, uh, increasing our, our distressed allocation should be helpful uh, from all the access to data we'll have on the CLO side. Uh, on the private debt side, what I would say is, you know, as markets mature post-crisis, everything becomes less about the beta of, let me just get assets on because assets are recovering from the crisis, and much more about exactly what assets you're going to buy and how you're going to risk manage those assets and select them. And what we've seen on the public side is markets are maturing. There's a big stretch for yield because of where treasuries are, because of Fed policy. And the public sector securitizations, people are forgetting about what happened pre-crisis. And issuer-friendly structures are becoming more and more prevalent, and yields are becoming lower and lower. So on the private credit side, we're able to manufacture and originate uh, asset-backed credit that has the characteristics on an underlying loan basis that we like, that have attachments that we like on a capital structure basis, and that have various triggers and structures that are not able to, to get as easily in the public market as a result. Um, the main reason being issuers are either too small and they need to get warehouse funding because of bank regulation. They view these, these short-term asset-based lending opportunities as short enough duration that they don't really, they prefer the liquidity over quibbling over how much yield they're paying out, uh, or they're, they're maturing businesses and they, they want to grow and they need growth capital. And it's a lot cheaper to pay us too much to, to give us debt than to take equity investments that, that's going to demand a much higher return. So I think playing in the, in sort of a niche between taking advantage of government regulations, so taking risks that banks used to take, um, is, is where we see it, levels of attractiveness right now. One of the things, Greg, that, that that I think about when I'm going into an illiquid position is, is a quote back from you about being in a pool without a towel. And so <laughs> being a guy who's so liquidity oriented, do you ever find that maybe in the future you could find yourself with some of the private lending in a pool without a towel where you'd then have to turn to the, some of the guys on my right for, for cover? For <laughs> well. I would never, if you're desperately looking for these guys for help, <laughs> you're in, in, in a world of hurt. So I, I hope that never happens. I, I, I think what's really important um, is, is to manage sort of the liquidity of, 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 your, of, your, of your funds. And I think one of the things that we really like about, about what we're doing is so generally, you know, my view about a lot of private debt is it's seven-year debt. People love it because it's par until it's not par. Whereas public credit, you know, it's par, it's 90, it's 95, it's 85. And if you can sort of just set it and forget it, if you believe that, you know, like there's a Disney movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven, if you believe that, you know, all debts are repaid, not having to worry about, about the timing of pricing is great. But what we love about private credit is actually it's enabled us, you know, we feel 
the Goldilocks era that we're in now for the last 10 years, it's gonna end, and it's going to end with either higher interest rates or, or a recession. Uh, it's not gonna continue, the 10-year the note's not gonna stay in like a you know, low, low to mid twos percent forever. And, and when it ends, if it ends with higher interest rates and sort of a, a boom, I think a lot of things are gonna be hard to refinance. And if it ends with a recession, there's gonna be a lot higher defaults. So what we've done in private credit is we've shortened up our duration a lot. We have, most of our private credit is one to two years. And as we think about, to your point about needing the towel, I think the key is really knowing the liquidity of your funds, right? So, so our master fund is quarterly 90 with a 25% investor gate. Our, our sort of direct lending is 10 to 15% of the fund. 70% of that is one year duration. 20% of that is two year duration. So our view, and we're really, really confident about the other 10%. So our view is, you know, that what we're getting in going into private credit is we're getting shorter duration than you can get in the public market. We're getting, you know, better underwritten collateral with tighter uh, triggers. Okay, I'm gonna go over to both, but we'll start with Glenn and then Victor. So, um, I, I have so many things to say without a question, but go ahead. <laughs> well, we, we, no, okay. then, then you could, <laughs> you can, you could tag them on to the answers. So first, yeah. in, in, we're at the third time in the, in the last 40 years of, of, of leverage finance history where the private multiples are higher than, than the public multiples. And, and uh, because, Glenn, you started in the business when you were 10 years old, you've been here for all three <laughs> of those times. Right. In the late 80s, and then uh, prior to the financial crisis, and then now. So first, and then Victor, I want your view on this. Is, is this really the leading indicator that we're about to go into a downturn? How soon does that come? And what are you guys going to do to pivot for it? So Glenn, right, you so, first. So real quick on the question. Everyone is late cycle. The world's coming to an end. But as I would highlight, as was commented on, people have felt that way for a while. We're in a different world. Technology has changed things. Inventory systems have changed classic business cycles. That's not to say that we shouldn't be cautious now when you have higher leverage and you have worse documentation and when you have more money chasing fewer deals, the returns are lower. I mean, the best time to be in private equity is when you have low multiples and low earnings. The best time to sell is when you have high multiples and high earnings. So that's the backdrop. And you just can't go home and say, I'm going to wait for the next five years or one year or three years, you just need to manage your portfolio defensively. And so that's one. Two is the business has changed dramatically as it has grown and matured. The early days of private equity when you could put up 5% of the capital structure and 95% debt with the help of Mike Milken and others, that doesn't exist today. And so not a shocker, when the business gets more competitive, returns go down. But that all being said, even though I may disagree with Raymond on the exact returns for private equity, because I know everyone in this room only invests in first quartile <laughs> funds, okay? But private equity is a good, solid asset class. So again, the question for investors is where do you allocate capital in a late cycle, but a cycle that can still go on for a while? And I happen to believe in a much longer discussion. It's more about political side. It's not about rates. Rates seem in much better shape. I don't think we're going to see a three and a half, 10 year for a while. You could be in low growth for a while. Jay Powell thought in October this could go on for a really long time until there's more concerns about global growth. That's that's first point. Secondly, the distressed market is a great opportunity at two times. One is when there's forced sellers, recession, and dislocation in the market, and all of us can make a lot of money when that happens. And then the second time is the more more idiosyncratic segments of a market, industries that are in distress, where those investors who really have capability can find opportunity. I entirely agree with Victor. Buying assets from the German banks that have been selling has been a great opportunity for us and for others on, the, on this panel because they're not prepared to execute what needs to be executed. On the structured credit side, as Greg was talking, we, we've built in our business a $15 billion loan business. We sponsored 15 billion of CLOs, and we manage a $3 billion portfolio trading in and out of other people's debt and equity in their structure deals. And we're ready when that opportunity comes, when there's dislocation like there was in the first quarter of 2016, and everyone, was walk, everyone who had a large energy exposure in their CLOs was walking out of the pool with no towel. And there was a massive dislocation 
and a great opportunity. So our job up here on a daily basis, and all of us have our own strategy, is to pick our spots where we have our own industry knowledge, where we have our own proprietary sourcing, analysis, management teams, relationships, seize on those opportunities, generate good risk adjust returns, regardless of the environment. And the last thing I should say on this private credit, when I think about the evolution of leverage finance, in the early days it was Drexel doing the high yield bond financing, then the banks bought up a lot of the, 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 the banks, the banks bought the investment banks who were doing the financing. In the third decade of leverage finance, guys like ourselves and Apollo and GSO got a lot, and Blackstone got, GSO Blackstone, got a lot larger. And now in this fourth generation of leverage finance, there's these giant pools of capital run by professional firms like ourselves. There's giant pools of private equity, and the banks not only in the smaller cap world, but in the larger cap, we're getting this intermediate, because why not just work with a relationship you have for decades and just go directly and we can write those same checks. So you got to be careful. You got to pick credit. Managers really do make a difference, and you got to be opportunistic. Victor, you up. <laughs> Uh, you know, let, uh, let, let me just add one more thing to the thinking on this, right? So, uh, you know, the, we, we all tend to, we're all conditioned to think about a recession and a great opportunity. It kind of creates for credit investing, for distressed investing, right? And if you think of it, the world like that, you say, boy, I only invest in 2002 and 2008 and no other time. You know what has happened in modern finance? Something, something quite troubling has happened in modern finance in the last 10 years. The amount, there's a real mismatch in liquidity. You have today, in classic high yield, you've got a high yield market which is seven times the size of what it was 20 years ago. 25% of it is daily liquidity. It can just redeem out ETFs, mutual funds, one day, daily liquidity. The total amount of trading capital on the other side has shrunk. It's a fraction of what it used to be. So now, in today's financial markets, and by the way, I love it, okay? What I'm going to tell you next. You could have a perfectly reasonable economy. In the US, we had a fine economy in 2011. High yield spreads gapped out to 1,000 over. In 2015, high yield spreads gapped out to 900 over. Liquidity, <clears throat> mismatch, high yield funds, loan funds want to sell. There isn't enough demand out there. So I, think, so I think when we think about opportunities, I wouldn't think of it as just, oh boy, it's a recession which is going to do it. It's going to be these liquidity-driven crises. There were two of them in 2018 in February and in the fourth quarter. 2015 was big, 2011, 12 was big. All this is happening even in a US economy which is growing, right? And that is, for people like us, that is the opportunity. Well, years ago, um, an ex-partner of mine from Drexel and two others had started a restructuring shop. And as, as the investment banker I am, I went in one time to call on him and they had a big, big painting in their conference room of three vultures, one of each representing Not them. Vultures. They did. And, <laughs> and what I find funny, Victor, is if I, if I look at what you guys do, I can't use that metaphor for what you do. Mm -hmm. So is it the stress is kinder, gentler? Is the branding better? Or is it because you're more operationally oriented than my old client would have been? You, you know, uh, People like us, and, and please, I, I, I have a sense of some of your businesses, but look, people like us are not buying distressed debt to flip it. That flipping stuff went out 10 years ago for us. We're buying distressed debt to take control of businesses, and you heard me describe it earlier. Some of these businesses are grossly mismanaged the last one or two years before bankruptcy to improve it, right? So now, now look, is, is that vulturish? I don't know. Uh, you know, we were, we were working out a deal in Portugal, and we are having the US ambassador, believe it or not, we've got the US ambassador helping us a little bit in Portugal with this deal. And I love the way he said it when he went to the Portuguese government to talk about us. He said, these guys are eagles. 
<laughs> I've never heard that before. I loved it. It's Trump's ambassador, the new real estate developer ambassador in Portugal. But that's 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 the world we are in. So there, there are yeah. clearly different distress. I'm sorry. Let me no, go ahead. Comment. There are clearly very different distress strategies, and the ability to add operational expertise is clearly just becoming another private equity player, which makes sense. But the reality is that. If you buy into a company that has too much debt and you're able to buy that debt at a sufficient discount, you can lead, as we have done, as many up here have done, you can convert that debt to equity and start anew. And so, or it can be in an industry like shipping or certain segments in real estate in Europe in particular where there's been such dislocation where the banks have thrown in the towel and have chosen to sell or choosing not to execute the right optimization strategy well, you can make very attractive returns with good downside protection. So again, I don't think that is necessarily vulture-ish, and you can work in a very, very constructive way with the parties. But anyway, so yeah, please. Just, uh, just a few. I mean, I, I think we, we're sort of looking in the mirror, back in the mirror. So okay, let's, let's sort of look forward. And I'm going to make a few statements which are probably unexpected. A, I think there's, no, there's, there's, there's less money after more deals. Because you say, Jim, that there's more dry powder than ever. Uh, I don't think this is right. I think there's about the same dry powder today in 2019 than there used to be in 2007. But guess what? There's twice as many companies under private equity ownership, whatever you call it, but private equity ownership. Uh, so our addressable market is way bigger than it used to be in 2007. Second, I think the private equity has to be super proud of what we are collectively bringing to the company that we support, being private debt, private equity, even distressed debt, because we've brought so much competence to those companies. Uh, we're talking a lot about returns here and leverage and liquidity and credit, but what about talking about bringing values, expertise, responsibility, ESG, operational expertise? How much investment have we all made in hiring the greatest people in the industry, coming from the corporate world, operating partners, board member? That's what we bring to those companies. So there's no just luck or miracle that those public companies become private, because we actually bring competence, expertise, ambition, way more than just money. Then third, I think everything that we do here around this panel is, is going to last pretty long and actually coexist at the same time together. I don't foresee something as similar as what happened in 2009. I think there'll be private equity investment in high growth companies, you know, good companies expanding internationally. There'll be private debts. I mean, I, in my portfolio company, for at least two-thirds of those companies, we want to have private debt financing. And we know we're paying more, of course, than what we can access to banks. But why are we doing this? Because this is flexibility. This is one partner that we can discuss with, rather than having a pool of banks, and this is what we had back in 2007 or 8. We had too many banks that we could not sort of talk to or negotiate with. And guess what? That handed it to, you know, uh, receivership, liquidation, you know, distressed debt, uh, buying into those debts. So private debt brings way more than just an instrument. It's a partner. That's the way I see private debt. And I think private debt is going to rise big time because it's a partnership approach with the private equity guys. And then in some sectors, there'll be need for distressed investors, because although there's gross capital, because there's some industries which are growing super fast, well, there's still, there are some industries being heavily disrupted, and they will need partners who have the guts to be investing as a distressed investors. So I think whatever we're trying to project that we've been through over the last 10 years is, is completely wrong. I think something by definition different is going to happen. So we can continue to forecast the, you know, the major you know, change, the major disruption, or the major you know, uh, market correction. But that's not going to happen uh, unless we continue to auto-realize that, because we're, we're, we're making it happen. We're less investing in companies. We're suddenly risk-averse. We're trying you know, to be <clears throat> you know, protecting our investments. So let's try to think that there are 
a number of us around you know, this panel and in this room who are needed to be supporting a wide different type of universe of companies. And you know, what we've been through in 09 or 10, it's not going to happen again. This is a big mistake to think the same way. At least we have to learn that from our you know, past mistakes. But you, you also have a pretty diversified portfolio of, of involvements from startup branding, bringing those brands global, venture capital even. So do you feel that perhaps you're well diversified so you don't need to be as concerned about the nature of the next turndown because it certainly won't turn down everything that you're doing? Well, of course I'm concerned, but I'm, I'm sort of more concerned for, for the companies that we support and we invest in. And I think, you know, the learning of, of the past is that you have to be more diversified. And I think what we're all trying to do here is not just, you know, get access to this enormous pool of capital that seems to be willing to invest in alternative asset management. Yes, we're doing that. But the reason why we're trying to diversify is that we are then able to offer to our clients, being either public investors or private investors, LPs, you know, the best of all worlds, being more diversified in what we do and bringing, you know, better and more resilient returns. So for sure, that's what Eurasio did by, you know, you know, having more diversified businesses, different pool of capital, different investment strategies. Because I'm a public company, so I need to make sure that I can provide to my public sh shareholders some good returns across cycles. But yes, and I think this is not going to change, and I think diversification is not going to be creating um, some, some you know, failures. I think diversification of what we do, we do it in adjacencies, as Raymond was saying, private debt is actually quite close to private equity. Unitranche or mezzanine type of financing is very close to private equity. So this is what we do because the public market doesn't really provide to to the right. company, <clears throat> what they need. So Raymond, I want to go back to you. Um, even though you're, you're expanding BDC's credit business, you know, the, f the foundation of your, of your business has been traditional private equity. So when you see Blackstone or KKR or Apollo go public, or if we look back in history and we see owners of many companies being diversified conglomerates you know, in the U.S., Grace or ITT, Integrated Resources, Beatrice Company. How is the way you're organized to run this portfolio of separate individual companies <clears throat> benefited by going public or benefited by staying private, avoiding what, what KKR and, and Carlisle try to do? Um, how, how do you think about <clears throat> that? Sure. First of all, I'd say I totally agree with what Virginia said. And I don't think I could have said it better. Uh, <laughs> but it's totally true. Um, you know, back to your question. <clears throat> uh, look, first of all, as far as we're concerned, uh, which I forgot to mention in the introduction, we were born, you were born public, we were born as a partnership. Um, and the DNA of a partnership is really important. And clearly, when you go public, from a partnership, that DNA changes. So, you know, for us, the partnership is a strength. Uh, this is not something that's holding us back. <clears throat> um, the second, as far as, far, as far as the diversification is concerned, uh, you know, we are a people, people business. You're good in private equity if you have good investors, experience, you know, a diversity of talent. <clears throat> uh, the reason why we went into private debt is because A, it made sense strategically, but more importantly, it is because we found, um, uh, you know, exceptional talent um, that instead of um, setting up shop on their own, decided to partner with us uh, and to become a real partner with us to build the business. Exactly the same thing in, uh, in real estate. <clears throat> so the way we're doing it <clears throat> in terms of management, uh, you know, actually hasn't been that complicated yet. Uh, I'm saying yet because those businesses were still scaling them. So, of course, you know, if at some point our private debt is like GSO, which is going to take some time given the size of GSO. Uh, uh, but, you know, at that point in time, we'll have other uh, management issues to, to, to sort out. But at the moment, it's managed by the teams. You know, it's relatively segregated. And, uh, you know, frankly, the only person, the only persons uh, that have uh, 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 an involvement across the platforms are A, 
uh, all of the support functions and finance and organization and compliance and stuff like that, which does not interfere by definition with the investment side of the business. <coughs> and second, myself, uh, because I sit on the investment committee of both of those, uh, the other strategies, uh, you know, which is something that you know, is manageable from a time standpoint. Uh, and then the rest of the corporation, the synergies happens by itself because it's a win-win. Uh, when we in private equity have to deal with liability management, I just need to go down the, down the hall and talk to Ted and the rest of the team and sort of figure out an expertise that I don't have. Uh, when they need uh, sector expertise, they just walk uh, down the other, hall, the other side of the hall um, and find us and you know, sort of know because we're a small firm as well. So that's how it works and it hasn't been disruptive so far. It has actually been incredibly constructive and positive for all of us. Well, we're going to be in the lightning round phase of this, of this panel. And so what I wanted to do was leave the biggest possible question for the 30 seconds you each have to answer it, which goes back to social responsibility. You know, we've been at panels here and, and capitalism better stand up to its obligation, whether it's to minorities, the gender, or to the distribution perhaps of capital or of, of, of wealth. So I'll run right to left, starting with Glenn. You know, how, how does the seat that you're in and your organization feel a responsibility or how you're addressing things, whether it's ESG or, or, or perhaps democratization and distribution of wealth? 30 seconds is impossible <laughs> to answer that, but what I will say is that ESG, recruiting a diverse employee partner base, working to be good citizens in the community, working with our companies and really understanding what they're doing and how they're doing and elevating it is not only good business, it's business that has to get done. And so it's important to us, it's important to our investors. We live in a, new, in a different world today from a government standpoint that could be on the tipping point of potentially changing. And unless we make an investment of our own, then we might not like how, how it comes down the other way. So it's all incredibly important on all sides. At a very personal level, I've, I've got to really go back to what Virginia said earlier. It's, uh, we started doing business in Europe about 15 years ago. And what that did to us as a firm, just in terms of thinking about social responsibility to thinking about ESG, I, I think Europe has been further ahead on that than the United States. And, and, I can only, and, I, and I can only just see the changes which have taken place in our firm as we, as we made that full-on transition. Um, I think you know, diversity of viewpoints is always additional and makes you smarter as investors. So, so diversifying the workplace is a key way to generating you know, a, a better long-term returns at, you know, at the same time. You know, we're, we're certainly aware of ESG. We've made a variety of, of direct lending and other investments in the solar space, but we're not an ESG-focused fund, so we also need to always remember, you know, what is the best risk-adjusted returns we can get uh, while, I guess, avoiding, you know, some of the sin businesses where you can. Uh Okay, just a few things. Well, the, my team, um, and especially the one I've built in the US from scratch, is completely gender balanced. And what would you expect from a women CEO? <laughs> um, it's actually more difficult to change you know, a, a bigger firm. So back in Europe, uh, I probably have 40% women in the team, which is uh, better, uh, way better than the average in our industry, but still not completely satisfactory. So that's one. Second, about 10 years ago, we took the decision by conviction that our companies needed to be ESG aware, ESG experts, and um, committed and engaged. There was a lot of uh, you know, reluctance from a number of our CEOs for good reason, you know, time, money. Um, but when you bring ESG to the table and you show that you're effectively, you know, um, doing good to your P&Ls, either savings um, or, you know, sa saving some costs by avoiding a number of uh, uh, things being ESG compliant or gaining businesses. So if you transform ESG into, you know, uh, a dollar-driven approach, that works pretty efficiently, uh, even with the more reluctant CEOs of the companies. Uh, so 10 years later, as a public company, Eurasio is part of the five index indices in the world which recognize ESG in the US, in Europe, and 
I think we are the only one in the industry to be part of those five index. So, but it's been 10 years work uh, and 10 years commitment. I've got a dedicated team at Eurasio, which only does uh, ESG for our portfolio company. That, that's sort of how it works. Thank you, Raymond. You're, you're the last word today. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I don't have much to add. I mean, the only thing I'd say is that, you know, clearly I think uh, being European does, 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 you know, there's perhaps been uh, a, a, much, a longer and deeper focus on ESG. Um, you know, so for us, you know, this is our legacy. It's part of our culture. We've been amongst on PE. We've been amongst the, the first uh, funds to adhere to the uh, UNPI, if I remember correctly, the acronym um, uh, principles. Um, and you know, as far as diversity is concerned, uh, you know, I wish we were at 40 percent. We're not there yet, uh, but we are certainly on our way, and we've improved dramatically. Uh, now, you know, diversity is not a question of just the gender. Uh, it's also a question of uh, you know, diversity of origin. <coughs> and uh, on that front, certainly in the New York office, I think uh, we beat uh, anybody in our business, um, uh, given the diversity that we have. We have a Frenchman, myself, a Brit, um, uh, an Asian American, uh, an Iranian American, an Italian, uh, uh, an American who is uh, from a family in Bangladesh, uh, and the last one is someone with Indian origin. Those are the seven partners on the PE side in New York. So I feel from a diversity standpoint, uh, this is very a rich uh, set uh, and diverse set of experience. Um, and it does uh, help us, I think, um, you know, have a more, uh, a better rounded, uh, you know, perspective on things generally. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so while the panel was, was, was going on, wrote the list of the five other panels that Mike should, and the Institute should do next year. And I would recommend these five panelists to be on call for that. Uh, thank you very much for your time and, and your experience and wisdom. Thank you to, uh, to everyone that, uh, that showed up today. And let's give my partners here a hand. Thank you very much.